in your Bible, I want you to mark two places. Romans chapter 9, and then turn to Jeremiah chapter 18. You know, if you've ever, you have ever heard me teach, you know I move fast. So if you're going to keep up, you can just jot down the notes. We won't have time to turn to all the scriptures that we hold out. I cover a lot. And like I said, mark something in Romans chapter 9, then turn to Jeremiah chapter 18. We are going on a journey tonight. We are going to a journey. We're going down to the potter's house, and we're going to see some things tonight that we have never seen before. In Jeremiah chapter 18, beginning in verse 1, the word of the Lord says, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my word. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again another vessel, as seemed good for the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. I don't have time tonight to tell you about how the potter chooses the clay, how he prepares the clay, how he rests the clay, how he wedges it, how he places it upon his wheel, how he names the clay, how he makes it into a vessel of his choosing, how he fires it in the hill, how he glazes it, and then how he puts it in the fire again. I don't have time to cover all of that, so I'm going to read you a story to describe the process of the potter working with the clay. The title of the, the story that I'm going to read is called The Teacup. There was a couple who used to go to England to shop in a beautiful antique store. This trip was to celebrate their 25th wedding anniversary. They both liked antiques and pottery, and especially teacups. Spotting an exceptional cup, uh, an exceptional cup they had. May we see that? We've never seen a cup quite so beautiful. As the lady handed it to them, suddenly the teacup spoke. You don't understand, it said. I have not always been a teacup. There was a time when I was just a lump of red clay. My master took me, and he rolled me, and he pounded me, and he pulled me, and he patted me over and over, and I yelled out, Don't do that. I don't like that. Let me alone. But he only smiled and gently said, Not yet. Then, wham! I was placed on the spinning wheel, and suddenly I was spun around and around and around. Stop it! I'm getting so dizzy. I'm going to be sick, I screamed. But the master only nodded and quietly said, Not yet. He spun me and poked me and prodded me and bent me out of shape to suit himself. And then, then he put me in the oven. I never felt such heat. I yelled and knocked and pounded at the door. Help! Get me out of here! I could see him through the opening, and I could read his lips as he sh shook his head from side to side. Yes. When I thought I couldn't bear it another minute, the door opened. He carefully took me out, put me on the shelf, and I began to cool. Oh, it felt so good. Ah, oh, this is so much better, I thought. But after I cooled, he picked me up, and he brushed and painted me all over. The fumes were horrible. I thought I would gag. Oh, please, stop it, stop it, I cried. He only shook his head and said, Not yet. Then, suddenly, he put me back into the oven. Only it was not like the first fire. This was twice as hot, and I just knew I would suffocate. I begged, I pleaded, I screamed, I cried. I was convinced I would never make it. I was ready to give up. Just then the door opened and he took me out and he placed me on the ship where I cooled and waited and waited, wondering what is he going to do to me next. An hour later he handed me a mirror and said, look at yourself. And I did. I said, that's not me. That couldn't be me. It's beautiful. I'm beautiful. Quietly he spoke. I want you to remember back to the beginning, he said. I know it hurt to be rolled and pounded and padded, but had I just left you alone? 
home, you're going to drive it. I know it made you dizzy to spin around on the wheel, but if I had stopped, you would have crumbled. I know it hurt, and it was hot and disagreeable in the oven, but if I hadn't put you there, you would have cracked. I know the fumes were bad, but I brushed and painted you all over. But if I hadn't done that, you never would have hardened. You would not have had any color in your life. If I hadn't put you back in that second oven, you wouldn't have survived for long because the hardness would not have healed. Now you are a finished product. Now you are what I had in mind when I first began with you. The moral of this story is God knows what he is doing with each of us. He is the potter, and we are his clay. He will mold us and make us and expose us to just enough pressures of just the right kind so that we may be made into a flawless piece of work to fulfill his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Amen? Amen. Amen. I want you to turn now to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. That gave you a quick explanation of what happened to the clay after it is dug out of the earth and how it is transformed from an ugly, nothing lump, a lifeless lump, into a beautiful vessel. And we're going to talk about seven types of vessels mentioned in the Word of God and how they compare to us. Romans chapter 9, beginning in verse 19. Romans chapter 9, beginning in verse 19. Paul writing to the church at Rome, and he, he writes and asks, Why does he yet find fault? Or who has convinced his will? Look at verse 20. Nay, but, O man, who art thou that replies or answers against God? Shall the thing form say in him that formed it? Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? Now notice the two types of vessels mentioned in verse 21. We read passages like this and we have no understanding of what they mean because we didn't live 2,000 years ago when, it, when Paul wrote this New Testament letter. But the people of his day understood exactly what Paul was talking about. So we are going to cover tonight the seven types of vessels mentioned in the Word. And the first type of vessel we're going to cover is the vessel of honor. Look at it, verse 21. Has not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor? The vessel of honor in Bible days was the most used vessel in the home. Therefore, it was the most frequently purchased vessel in the potter's shop. The potter spent much time making this vessel because it fulfilled the most important role in every house in Bible days. Each day, the young women of the home would take this vessel to a well or to a stream. And the young women of every home in the Holy Land area, they would take their vessels to the well or the stream, and they would fill their vessels with fresh, clean water for the family and for the guests in the home to drink. Just inside the door of every home stood a bench about three or four feet high. This bench had three holes in it. And the bench was called the water jar bench. One hole was for the vessel of honor, one hole was for the vessel of dishonor, and one for the small drinking vessel. The young woman brought the vessel filled with fresh water and placed it in the first hole in the bench, the hole that was closest to the door. And everyone knew that entered into that house, they knew which vessel was the vessel of honor by its placement on the bench. Its main purpose was to pour fresh water to quench your thirst. When the young women filled that vessel with water, it was a custom there at the well or any time they were walking back home. It was a custom in Bible days for anyone that they met that wanted a drink of water all they had to do was ask that young woman for a drink, and it was a custom that she would give them a drink. This custom is beautifully illustrated in the story of the woman at the well who gave Jesus a drink. 
in John chapter 4, verses 5 through 15. And I ask you tonight, are you a vessel of honor? Do you daily go to the source to fill yourself with cool, refreshing water of the Word of God? Do you spend time in the Lord's presence and allow Him to cleanse you by the washing of the water of the Word? As Ephesians 5, 26 says, you must first be filled with the water of the Word and with the precious Holy Spirit before you can pour out that life giving water for others to quench their thirst. Is your vessel filled so that you can draw water out of that well of salvation that is within your spirit? Isaiah chapter 12 verse 3 says, Therefore with joy shall you draw water out of the well of salvation. Is your vessel filled with fresh clean water? Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 3 says, For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty. Vessels of honor long to be the pipeline for life-giving water to flow through. Vessels of honor pour out of themselves in complete abandonment and praise and in worship and in adoration unto God. And let him fill them to overflowing so they can pour out of their lives into the lives of others that they need. Oh God, I want that. Don't you? I want to be a vessel of honor. Vessels of honor are always pouring out of themselves, seeking to be filled again with the Spirit and the precious Word of God, only to pour out of themselves again unto others that they need, that are thirsty for the water of life. I ask you, are you a vessel of honor? The second type of vessel mentioned in the Word is the vessel of mercy. Romans chapter 9, verse 23. Romans chapter 9, verse 23. And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had afore or before prepared unto glory. As I said earlier, we read these scriptures and we're clueless to what they mean. But everyone in Paul's day understood perfectly the word picture that Paul was using. In Bible days, in appearance, the vessel of mercy looked like, and it was, a vessel of honor. It too was filled each day with fresh water from the spring or from the well. But unlike the vessel of honor, which was placed on the water jar bench in the home, the vessel of mercy was taken into the sea and placed in the sea. It was placed there to provide a refreshing drink to anyone passing by. Vessels of mercy in Bible days were always found in the marketplace. God may have called you to be a vessel of mercy. He may have destined you to be filled with the life-giving water of the Word and with His Holy Spirit in order for you to pour out to others that you come in contact with in the marketplace at work. Have any of you ladies work? All right, all right. God may have placed you in your job in order for you to minister to wounded, broken humanity who have lost their way. The Lord wants to use you as the source of refreshment as you go through your daily routine. Be filled with the Spirit and be filled with the Word of God because your market slaves need the Savior. They need to meet the life source who is Jesus so they too can be filled with the life-giving water of the precious Holy Spirit. People are thirsty. They're thirsty for someone to give them a refreshing drink of the Holy Spirit. Everywhere you go, there are people who are empty and long for someone just to love them. Has God called you to be a vessel of mercy, to pour out to them and quench their thirst? If so, He wants to fill you with Himself so that He can set you in the marketplace. And everyone you encounter, you need to drink of the water of life that is within you. Pour it out in the belly. Are you a vessel of mercy? Then there's the chosen vessel. That's the third type of vessel that's mentioned in the Word of God. The chosen vessel. 
Turn to Acts chapter 9, verse 15. Acts chapter 9, verse 15. The Lord spoke to Ananias about Paul, and he said in Acts chapter 9, verse 15, The Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles. Notice what Jesus called Paul. He said that Paul is a chosen vessel unto me. What was the chosen vessel in Bible days? The chosen vessel was made from the same clay as the vessel of honor and the vessel of mercy. To the eye, it looks just the same as the other vessel, but its beauty and its value is known only to the potter. The potter looked at the chosen vessel and knew that it was the absolute best that his hands could make. After it came out of the fire of the kiln, the potter handled it differently than his other vessels. Instead of placing the chosen vessel on the shelf in his shop so that any customers coming by could purchase it, no, he didn't do that with the chosen vessel. He took the chosen vessel to a small, dark room, and he placed it in a low shelf, and he closed the door when he left the place. And when a customer came to the potter's shop to buy a vessel, they never saw the chosen vessel. A customer would come to the potter's shop, and after looking at all of the wares, the customer would request a chosen vessel. And to this day in Jerusalem, a visitor can go into a potter's shop and request a chosen vessel. A smile of pleasure may come over the potter's face, or a look of glee may flicker in his eye, because he is so delighted that you have asked for a chosen vessel. The customer you see does not choose the vessel. The potter alone goes into the dark storage room and chooses the vessel. That's how this vessel gets its name, to be a chosen vessel. He selects the vessel, brings it out of the dark room, and before handing it to the customer, he adds one more thing to that vessel. He turns it over and he signs his name on the bottom. Every vessel in the potter's shop bears the potter's mark, but only the chosen vessel bears his name. And isn't that true with us today? Look at verse 15 again. The Lord said to Paul, He is a chosen vessel unto me to do what? To bear my name. If the Lord singles you out to be a chosen vessel, He will require of you a greater discipline and a more intense commitment than He requires of any other type of vessel. Everything that is not of Him must be removed from your life. Everything you trust in. Everything he loves so much and yet keeps you from him and him alone. It must be removed. The Master Father will deal with you with severity. He will not allow one stone to be left unturned in your life. He will not allow one hidden motive or one secret sin or anything to remain in you that is not pleasing to him. Perhaps you cry out and say, God, I yield to your will. Remove everything in my life that is not pleasing to you. I know you've called me into your service. I know you've chosen me to bear your name to a hurting world. And I want to be used of you to help people. Is that your cry? And you wait, and you wait, and you wait. Sitting on a ship alone in the dark room. You wonder if the Master Potter even remembers who you are. You ache to be a vessel to give cool, refreshing water to others as no doors of opportunity open. And with the passing months and even years, the yearning to be used of the Lord grows more intense. And you cry out in the darkness, Why, God, why? Yet God's voice is silent. Have you ever gone through seasons of silence and darkness in your life? Have you ever gone through times of being used mightily of the Lord? And then it seems that doors of opportunity close. I have. I'm there now. I went from teaching in churches all the time and doing ladies' meetings all the time and doing tent meetings and teaching on the radio, you name it. I went from teaching to approximately 200 people in the church I attended teaching only a handful 
of people in a Bible study. And I cry out in the darkness of the storage room shelf and I say, why God? I know you've placed a calling on my life I'm to teach your word. I long to be used with you, Lord, yet in the darkness of God's storage room, the Lord is silent. Have you ever been there? Have you ever gone through times like that? Are you there now? If you are a chosen vessel, you understand the heartache of the darkness of the storage room ship. But what you and I must remember when we go through those times is that the master potter has not forgotten us. Don't you see? He is working his eternal weight of glory in us. Even though we can't see what he do, even though it looks like he's not doing anything in our lives, we must trust him. As the word says in Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 10, says, Who is among you that walketh in darkness and hath no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God. That's what we have to do here in those times when we don't hear his voice, when all is silent. It seems like nothing is happening in us. When it seems like there's no doors of opportunity, that's what we have to do during those times is to trust the master of the During those times of darkness on the storage room shelf of life, that's where we learn to trust the Lord. That's where we learn to trust our master father. So that the next time we go through a time of storage shelf living, we will know and we'll remember we've been there before and the Lord has brought us out and he will again. We have to remember, and I want you to write this down, he has not set you aside just to be a part You realize through the long seasons of darkness that you are still under the master potter's watchful eye. And at times, you see the potter open the storage room door, walk past you, choose another vessel, and leave you sitting on the ship. Can you rejoice when your brother or your sister has been chosen for God's servant instead of you? If you can't, then your time on the ship is not complete. God still has a work to do in you. And then one day, the potter opens that dark storage room door, and a ray of light shines in. And the potter walks in, and he stops in front of your shelf, and he looks carefully at all the vessels. He puts out his hand, and his hand pauses over you, and then his hand rests on you. He picks you up, and he holds you up to the light, and his smile of approval sends your heart racing. The call for a chosen vessel has come, and he is sending you. He brings you out of the dark storage room. And the light is almost too much for you to bear. He turns you over and he signs his name on you and he sends you forth in his service because you are now ready to be filled with the life giving water of the word of God and with the Holy Spirit. And you now have his anointing. And you try watering one. Here is right for you and for you and for you. Oh God, let this be me. Let me be a chosen vessel under you. Do you want to be a chosen vessel? Yes, I, I want to be used of you. But I want to learn the lesson in the darkness of the story. Well, that the master father can do the work in me to get me ready to be used of him to pour out of my vessel into hurting, broken humanity. Amen? Amen. And in the fourth type, the fourth type of vessel is the clean vessel. The clean vessel. Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 20 says, Bring an offering in a clean vessel into the house of the Lord. Well, what in the world is a clean vessel? Well, a clean vessel in Bible days, when the potter originally made it, the clean vessel was originally a vessel of honor. Yet over time, and because of frequent use, this vessel of honor has become marked, scarred, and a residue or film has begun to cling to the inside, and the lip has worn 
so that water doesn't pour forth correctly from its mouth. No longer can this vessel be used at the front door of the house as a vessel of honor, but it's moved now to the back of the house. Like verse 20 of Isaiah 66 says, it describes and it tells us that it was now used for carrying grain offerings to the house of the Lord. So the people, they were required at times to bring an offering to the Lord. And they would put their offering of grain because they didn't have the money system. We bring our tithes to the house of the Lord. But in those days, they brought the fruit of the ground. And they would put their grain into the flame vessel. They would take it to the house of the Lord and give it to the Lord as an offering. And several times a year, the priests in the house of the Lord would collect the clean vessel, and then they were taken from the temple back to the potter's house. And there the vessel goes through a four-step process in order for it to once again be able to be used as a vessel of honor. The clean vessel is first emptied of any of its remaining contents of grain. That's the first step. If you're taking notes, you can just write four lines, one number of one, two, three, four. Step one, the clean vessel is emptied of its remaining contents of grain. Step two, the potter uses strong brushes and files to scrape the vessel inside and out. Strong brushes and files, and he scrapes that vessel inside and out. Number three, he will reset and file the lip so it can once again pour out water properly. Number four, the fourth step that the potter does is the vessel is then put back into the fire again. After these four steps are complete, the clean vessel is now ready to be used once again as a vessel of honor. Think about it. Through your continued service for the Lord, have you become scratched? Have you become scarred? Has your lip become warm? Are you weary of spreading the good news when it seems like it's falling on deaf ears? Do you witness to your family and it seems like they're not listening? Do you have wayward children? Are you growing weary with sharing the word of the Lord with them? Or perhaps a film coats your heart due to the problems, the tests, the trials, that you've gone through in your life? Has your heart become callous and insensitive to others' needs? Do you need to be restored? Every Christian has time when they need to be restored. And we must go back to the Father and submit to His restoring touch. We must get in His presence and praise and worship Him and sit quietly at His feet and allow Him to clean our vessel again. We also must go through this four-step process. Number one, we must allow Him to empty us of everything that is not of Him. Number two, we must allow the Father to scrape us with the strong brush of the Word and remove the residue of hurts, any unforgiveness, etc., that has formed a film over our heart. We must be washed and cleansed by the washing of the water of the Word, Ephesians 5, 26. Number three, our lip must be reset, just like the vessel's lip is worn and misshapen, wider than it should be. And it can't pour forth water properly. It, it must be reset. Christians in the body of Christ do more damage with their lips, don't they? We say things that hurt others and leave them wounded and bleeding. Proverbs 18, 21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. James chapter 3 and verse 8 says, The tongue can no man come it is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. We must allow the potter to deal with our tongue and reset our lips. And then number four, we must allow the potter to put us back into the fire. But we cry and we say, Oh God, not the fire. You've emptied me, you've scraped me, you've filed me, you've reset my lips. That's enough, Lord. Please, not the fire again. Lord, I can't take it. I'll die. And he asked, you promise? And into the fire we go. We come out. We are once again a vessel of honor, ready to pour out the life-giving water to everyone around us. This type of vessel. Mentioned in the Word of God is the vessel of dishonor. The vessel of dishonor. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 20. The Word of God says that in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, which is clay, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Romans chapter 9 verse
verse 21, says, Hath not the pot of power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel under honor and another under dishonor? What was the vessel of dishonor in Bible days? Well, the vessel of dishonor had originally been fashioned by the potter to be a vessel of honor. But the vessel had become pot marked in the fire due to either air in the clay or a problem with the glaze or some other flaw that made the potter unhappy with the vessel. It may have had some hidden impurity in the clay or some stubborn resistant quality that caused it to refuse to yield to the fire. And when the potter removed it from the field and saw its imperfection, he knew that it could not be sold at full price, so it was marked down and sold at a reduced price. People purchased both vessels of honor and vessels of dishonor from the potter almost weekly in Bible days. The vessel of dishonor was used for two main purposes. Number one, it was placed beside the vessel of honor on the water jar bench at the front door of every home in Bible days. And the stale, leftover water from the vessel of honor was poured into the vessel of dishonor. It was a custom to wash your hands and your feet upon entering every home in Bible days. And usually the servant poured water from the vessel of honor over your hands and your feet. Why did your feet need washing? Because you walked on the dusty road. And so the water was caught and then poured into the vessel of dishonor. That was the first use of the vessel of dishonor. The second use of the vessel of dishonor was, was used in the kitchen in Bible days. And all the leftover food was placed into the vessel of dishonor in the kitchen. And the food would quickly sour and begin to smell. And when this vessel in the kitchen was full, the homeowner carried it out to the back of their property and threw it away. And after it was cast away, it was forever called an abominable vessel. Isaiah chapter 65 and verse 4 says, think about it. Does God, the master father, really make vessels of dishonor to be used as garbage cans in his house? No, no, a thousand times no. Everything God makes is good. He never saves someone. He never places his spirit within them and then at the same time makes them evil. No, he would not do that. Vessels of dishonor are self-appointed vessels. How many of you know Christians who are eager to hear every tidbit of gossip, every rumor, every negative thing that is said about someone, whether it's true or not, they are opening their vessel up to become a garbage disposal. We need to refuse to allow, allow ourselves to be opened up to gossip or criticism or any negative thing. And certainly we are not to be the source of the gossip and the criticism. We are not to call up our friend and say, hey, did you hear about so-and-so? Every church, I think, has a sister bucket mouth, don't they? They called up sister do that and said, hey, let me tell you what I just heard. Did you hear about this? Every church has at least one, don't they? But Paul warned Timothy about young widows who were idle, who would become, as 1 Timothy 5, 13, says, tattlers and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. 1 Peter 4, 15 says, that do not be an evildoer or a busybody in other men's matters. And if you are guilty of this, we've got to repent don't we? And stop it immediately. We do not want to be a vessel of dishonor. Think about it. How many Christians do you know watch things that they shouldn't on TV, on the internet? They are opening their vessels to garbage. They are becoming filled with junk of this world. And they are becoming vessels of dishonor. But unlike the vessels of dishonor in Bible days, which the earthly potter could never make into a clean vessel or a vessel of honor again. God, the master potter, can take vessels of dishonor and who genuinely repents, he can once again make them into clean vessels and vessels of honor for his use. He can take them through that four-step process and he can restore their lives and he can make them once again be clean, pure, honorable 
vessel ready to be used of him once again. The sixth type of vessel mentioned in the Word of God is the, bro the broken vessel. The broken vessel. Psalms chapter 31 and verse 12. The psalmist David writes and he says, I am like a broken vessel. I am like a broken vessel. A broken vessel is a vessel that either could not or would not take the heat of the fire of the kill. The fire produced a crack in this vessel and it was usually around the lip. The broken vessel was the wounded vessel in need of immediate repair. And who of us have not become broken at times in our lives? Who of us have not become cracked pots in the fiery trials of life? We need the touch of the master potter to repair us, don't we? In Bible days, when a vessel came out of the keel and it was cracked, Fortunately, the potter had a remedy in order to salvage the vessel. Now listen, don't miss this. Watch, don't miss this. The potter in Bible days would go to the local shepherd, and the potter would say to the shepherd, I need to examine your sheep. The potter would run his hands over the wool of the sheep, and he would part that wool, and he would look for a small, pit-like insect called the suka. And when the potter had found several of these pit like insects on the shepherd's sheep, he would collect them, he would pull them off of the, the sheep, and the potter took them home and kept them in a small leather cap or a small clay pot. And the potter would take the pasuka and squeeze it in order to get the blood which it had sucked from the lamb and then he would mix that blood, that lamb's blood, with the dry, crushed, powdered clay and form a mixture that worked effectively and uniquely like glue. Slowly he labored to work the mixture into the crack. It took him a long time to complete this process, but he worked patiently. Now think about it. The cross of Calvary provides the glue to fix the lives of cracked, flawed men and women. The blood of Jesus is better blood than that of animals. Hebrews chapter 9 verses 12 through 14 tells us the blood of Jesus is better blood than the natural earthly sheep. Hallelujah. Patiently and lovingly our master potter applies the blood of the lamb to restore his vessel that has been cracked and wounded by the fiery trials of life. Now, after the vessel, which had cracked in the fire, was repaired with the blood mixture, the potter placed the vessel right back into the same fire that had cracked it in the first place. He would re-fire that vessel in the hill. And when he took it out of the hill, if the fire had cracked that vessel again, the potter repeated the process. He repeated the process over and over in order to save that vessel. He would keep applying the blood of that lamb mixed with the dry powdered clay. Keep applying it to the crack in that vessel. Keep putting it back into the fire of the hill. And only after the vessel came out of the fire without a crack did the potter release it to be sold. We often resent being placed back into the same fiery trial of life that broke us or caused us to crack. So we, we cry out, Lord, haven't I been through enough? How many of you have had long, extended periods of fiery trials? I tell you, for the last two and a half years, it has been nothing but one long, fiery trial. But the fire that we go through in our lives is what strengthens us and makes us durable vessels of clay. The fire is what proves us. First Peter 4, 12 says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you or to prove you. Remember, the blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God, applied to our lives is sufficient to enable us to withstand any fire, any fires of life that come. And we need to remember that the heavenly potter has his hand on the thermostat of the fiery furnace of affliction that we're in. 
He is controlling the temperature of the furnace that will prove us and try us. Because God said in Isaiah 48, 10, Behold, I have refined thee. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. Isaiah chapter 43, and verse 2, says, I will be with thee when thou walkest through the fire. God takes us through the fire, not around it. In the fire. Even though you may think you are alone, I'm sure Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thought when they were being thrown into the fiery furnace, I'm sure they thought that they were in there alone. But they soon found out that the fourth man was in the fire with them, and we can rest assured that the fourth man is in the fire every time with us. He will not leave us alone, and he has covered us with the blood of the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. And his blood will keep us from being consumed with the fire. The master pot never takes his eyes off of us when we are in the fire. And you can rest assured that you will come forth from the fire a whole restored vessel. Ready once again to be filled with the life giving water of the Word and of the Holy Spirit. And ready to pour that water forth into the lives of us. And the last type of vessel is mentioned in the Word of God. The seventh type of vessel is the vessel of wrath. Romans chapter 9, verse 22. Romans chapter 9, verse 22. What is God willing to choose? Use his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering, the vessel of wrath, it is to destruction. Notice that. The vessel of wrath, it is to destruction. There are a few vessels that absolutely refuse to accept the mixture of the lamb's blood taken from the procedure and mixed with the powdered clay, which the color used to mend the craft. And after many times of laboring to repair the crack and placing that vessel back into the fire, the potter realizes the vessel is going to refuse the blood and not allow itself to be mended. The potter has no other remedy than the blood mixture. So the vessel becomes a vessel of wrath. The potter, much to his dismay, took the vessel of wrath to a place overlooking the potter's field high on the wall of Jerusalem and cast that vessel down. And it was shattered into pieces. And it became what the scripture calls broken potsherd. Once the vessel is shattered, it can never be put together again. Jeremiah chapter 19 and verse 11 says, God said this of his stubborn, rebellious, idolatrous people. I will break this people as one breaketh the potter's vessel that cannot be made whole again. Psalm chapter 2 and verse 9 says, Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 27 says, That as the vessel of a potter shall they be broken to shivers. You may be thinking, I've been that idolatry, stubborn, rebellious vessel. You may be thinking, I've sinned to the point that I have become that broken, shattered, worthless vessel. So there is no hope for me. But I came by to tell you tonight that there is hope for you. It is not too late for you. Even though the earthly potter in Bible days could not repair a broken vessel that was broken to pieces and shattered in a potter's field, the heavenly potter can repair that broken vessel. He can repair your broken vessel tonight. I say the very best for last. Now, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27, beginning in verse 7. The very first reference to the potter's field in the New Testament is where Judas returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest. Matthew chapter 27 and verse 7. And they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field. Notice that. The very strangers in them. Look at verse 9. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value, and gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord appointed me. And don't miss me. Watch, watch, watch. Don't miss me. In Bible days, thirty pieces of silver 
heard was the cry of a female slave. Thirty pieces of silver was the price paid for a female slave. The New Testament tells us that church is the bride of Christ. And Jesus paid the price for his bride. He purchased us, not with silver or gold, but the price he paid for us was with his life. And his laid down life and his poured out blood. Today, you may be lying in a potter's field. You may be a broken, willing, wasted vessel, but Jesus' blood, the blood of the Lamb of God, will repair your mended and mend your broken vessel. He will repair it. He will put your vessel back together again and make it whole. He will cover you with his blood. He will put you back together. He will fill you with himself and once again restore you and make you a vessel of honor ready for his use. For you are his worthy vessel. Which vessel are you? Are you a vessel of honor? Filled with the life-giving water of the Holy Spirit and with the word of God and ready to be poured out into all people. Are you a vessel of mercy? Working in the marketplace and filled with the cruel, refreshing water, giving us hope to everyone you need. Or are you a chosen vessel? One who is called and anointed by God and longing to be poured out in service for the most gifted speaker and the dark stories of waves, 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 for stories to open the world. Are you the clean vessel, needing to be empty, straight, clean, your lips reset and put back into the fire, so you can once again become a vessel of honor, or a vessel of dishonor? It'll only look stale, used, leftover water and food, and you smell the wind you to the show. And you'll allow your vessel to be filled with. 
me by the soul of your faith. And I knew you would be 